Thank you for coming, everyone. This is the first time I've uh, shared my new Circle uh, compiler features. So I'm calling the talk uh, Circle Evolve C++ makes the language safer and more productive, but I have some alternate, I got some uh, alternate titles to put ideas in your mind, like how to turn C++ into a language research platform. If you have some ideas about memory safety or about pattern matching, people think it's, it's too much to implement that into a compiler and they'd rather start from scratch, so you get a toy language, but what does a toy language really get you? Are you not able to consume your dependencies? You're not able to test your ideas in an industrial environment? So I want C++ to be looked at as a great language research platform. It's already multi-paradigm. Let's just make it more, paradig you know, more paradigmatical. Uh, how to incentivize investment in language technology. Uh, what's your bang for your buck if you're a, a big tech company and you have a tooling team or you have a compiler team? Like, what is that doing for your balance sheet? And I hope that um, looking at this kind of flexible technology, we can increase the incentive for investing in, in fundamental tooling. Uh, a no consensus model for C++ governance. Right now, if you have an idea and it's really important for your organization and you think it can save your organization a lot of money, you still have to clear the consensus bar. You have to convince a, a good majority of ISO members or working group members to buy into your idea. And they might not care. It might be a great idea, but they don't care. So how can we lower the bar for entry? Uh, finally, one simple trick to unshackle creativity in C++ language evolution. I have a lot of features. I have like 30 new features in this compiler. Uh, but I don't really care about the individual features. I care about the mechanism for allowing you to evolve the language to fix defects. And that's the one simple trick. All right, so uh, 2022 was the year of successor languages. We had three successor languages announced. We had Carbon, that's the, the big, well-funded Google effort. Uh, we had CPP2, which is Herb Sutter's effort, and we have the Val compiler by Dave Abrahams. Uh, these are not C++, but the idea is that they uh, don't have some of C++'s historical technical debts, and they have some features we want, and there will be some level of compatibility with C++ code. We don't know what, it's unspecified, but that's the, those are the, the guiding principles. Um, this is from Chandler's announcement for Carbon. Um, why start a new language? Because number one, C++ has accumulated technical debt, decades of technical debt. Um, people talk about wrong defaults in the language, this is what they mean, and technical debt costs bu business billions of dollars. Uh, the number two thing is that the guiding light of C++'s history is its backwards compatibility. Uh, the whole point is not to break existing code. Like your, your code from 20 years ago should compile with, with an existing compiler without any changes. Um, and number three, new features, be, to keep backwards compatibility going, new features are workarounds a lot of times. Look at these like silly keywords and he pulled this out. We don't want to have natural looking keywords like await yield because await and yield are likely identifiers in a lot of code. So to get around that, we have to kind of look for the cracks and we have to kind of mangle our own identifiers to, to make keywords. Uh, the consequence is that C++'s commitment to backwards compatibility prevents it from fixing its technical debt. We're trapped. So we want to create a new language, right? We can't fix the technical debt within C++ because we can't uh, break or change the meaning of existing code. Well, that's kind of the core motivation between all these successor language efforts. Uh, the Carbon effort cites the accumulation of technical debt, by which they mean language design choices they don't like, as the motivation for starting a whole new tool chain. And I've highlighted here in, this, in their manifesto the decades of technical debt. I mean, that's, that's a lot of technical debt, right? They call out some specific examples, like integer promotion rules, where if you multiply integers, uh, you know, multiply characters or shorts, they're bumped up to integer for historical reasons. Uh, and the complex declaration syntax that gives you the most vexing parse. Um, and there's a lot of, like, of these wrong defaults. So I've listed 11 here. Uninitialized automatic variables. That's likely going to get patched at some point. But the rest of these you can't modify without breaking your dependencies. Integer promotions you can't change. You can't ban implicit narrowing conversions. Switches should probably break rather than fall through, but you can't change that. Operator precedence is complicated. In the case of bitwise operators, it's wrong. It goes on and on. So a system that can't fix its mistakes is an unhealthy system. But we have to ask, does C++'s commitment to backwards compatibility actually prevent us from fixing its technical debt? And I say, no, it doesn't. We can fix it. It's easy to fix C++. The assumption that you can't modify the language without breaking existing code 
is responsible for lots of bad decision making. Uh, I've, those 11 wrong defaults I've listed, I have 11 discrete fixes. They're all independently versioned, so you can choose which ones you want to subscribe to, or you can take the whole suite of them. They're very easy to implement. If you identify a defect, you can probably fix it. We can fix our mistakes. And that's really the, the, the core message for this talk, is that we can fix our mistakes. And it's easy to evolve C++. We can do more than just fix mistakes. We can add new features. Uh, what is this? I'll just talk of successor languages. So here I have a choice type. This is like a, a Rust enum. It's a discriminated union. Uh, I've got on line 13, I have a function declaration. It starts with the fn keyword. The parameter declaration is different. The variable declaration on line 14 is different. The ranged form on line 15 is different. I have uh, a pattern match right here on line 29 that breaks open the choice type. OK, so this is, this is C++, but it looks just like carbon. It looks just like, which in turn looks like Rust. So you can change the syntax. This is almost a one-to-one uh, one copy of a Rust traits example, the, the dolly the sheep example. So I have an interface on line 7. Um, and I can define an interface. I can implement the interface on line 34. And then I can invoke interface methods. On, uh, in main, on line 63, I can call the, the talk shear and talk interface methods. These are just like Rust traits. And this is all in a C++ compiler, and it doesn't break anything. Bubbles of new code. Um, when Herb Sutter gave his uh, CPP2 announcement last year, his motivation is that if we had an alternate C++ syntax, it would give, give us a bubble of new code that doesn't exist today, where we can make arbitrary improvements. And he lists all these things that are great ideas. We want to change the defaults to remove unsafe parts. Uh, improve the syntax to make it more context-free and order-independent, and apply 30 years worth of learning free of backward source compatibility constraints. So he's, he's saying bubble of new code with new syntax, alternate C++ syntax. I want bubbles of new code, but I don't want a new language. It's super expensive for everyone to learn a new language. I need to create bubbles of new code anywhere, uh, and I want to do it completely separately from an alternate C++ syntax. So my idea is just declare that your code operates by new rules and not the old rules. Uh, I factor these changes, these bubbles of new code, into features. So everything in uh, green is a different feature, and it changes basically just one thing. So as uh, creates an as expression, as is a keyword. Choice creates that um, the choice keyword, which is for discriminated unions. There's a forward keyword to make forwarding a first class thing. Interface is like interface and impulse. Placeholder keywords, this underscore is now a keyword. Uh, these are all discrete changes, and they have limited scope. So you can use them whenever you want just by saying, I'm subscribing to this feature. So how do these things work? Well, I have uh, a feature pragma. So you use pound pragma feature. Pragma is a, a vendor-specific way to modify translation. And, and tools that don't understand the pragma are just free to skip over them. So you say pound pragma feature XYZ, where XYZ are the features you want to buy into, and you can also turn them off. But the, the great thing about this, or the, I guess the novel aspect here, is that uh, these, these uh, affect the translation you know, only within the file. So if I have a, a pragma feature interface, uh, now everything below that in that file subscribes to the interface feature. But when I get to another file in the same translation unit, no more. It's now that other files. Um, responsibility to set its own features. So there's a per file active mask of features. And these two directives, pragma feature and pragma feature off, twiddle the features in the active mask only for that file. So let's take a look at what we can do here. Uh, so I've got a normal translation. In, there's nothing at the top. There's no pragma feature at the top. I declare objects, interface and impl. Normal objects because those are identifiers. Then I subscribe to the interface feature and the self feature. And now I can use interface as a keyword. Because before, interface is just parsed, or is lexed as an identifier, and below, it's lexed as a keyword. And now that opens up all this new capability. Self is a keyword, which is the L value of this. Because I said, ah, it's, it's weird for, self to, or for this to be a pointer, so let's make a, a value version of that, which is self. Uh, impl is a, is a keyword now that's been activated. So I can bring uh, interfaces into scope so that I can call their interfaces, interface methods without qualifications. It's very Rust-like. So now I've shadowed the interface and impl objects, but I can still escape to address them. So you can write any string in backtick. So backtick interface is a backtick identifier. It changes that string into an identifier, and you can, you can backtick anything. So I can backtick double, and now there's an identifier in double. This is a way to access 
identifiers that have been previously been shadowed. And also works great with reflections, so you can put in human readable strings there, user facing strings, and make those data members and then reflect on that. But there is a way to get back to um, variable names that you've shadowed or function names that you've shadowed. And finally, I can turn the feature off, and now it's like I'm back to using these things as identifiers. So the, the new feature only extends out to where the feature is active within that one file. Uh, here's an example from the Carbon documentation on uh, simpler precedence. So they don't like the operator precedence rules, and I have a, a deeper example of why not. So they have this, this flow chart here sh uh, showing partial precedence. It actually changes the precedence of things like the bitwise operators to be higher precedence than comparison, which they're not in C++, which I think is a real defect. And I can actually change the way that the binary expressions are parsed. So this is a way standard or ISO C++ parses where uh, this, this assert is true because the uh, comparison has higher precedence than the bitwise op. And then I turn on the simpler precedence feature, and now the bitwise op has higher precedence than the comparison, which is what you'd expect because that's like an arithmetic operation. It's not really a logical operation. Uh, the active mask is written to the token stream at every source location. So I have an active mask. I can change that using this, these uh, uh, feature pragmas. And then every time I emit a token to the translation unit, I'm also emitting the active mask. And that's a really sparse data set because you're not changing the uh, feature mask that often in a 200,000 or a million token translation unit, right? Very sparse data set. So it's very compact and easy to search into. And Circle takes feature specific actions based on the mask at every source location. So sometimes this happens very early on, like uh, during uh, tokenization. I'll promote certain identifiers to keywords, like interface and info will be promoted to keywords. Uh, sometimes it's later on, like during parsing, where the binary expression grammar is parsed depending on the availability of different features. So if you want that carbon style operator precedence, when I parse binary expression, it'll look, is that feature active for this source location? If it is, use the, use the new partial precedence. If it's not, use the ISO precedence. And also, uh, it can change semantics around anything, including arithmetic. So I can turn off integral promotions by testing, do I want integral promotions here or not? If the, if the feature is on, to turn those off, I don't do the integral promotions. Templates don't create confusion. This was an issue brought up surrounding epochs. Only consider the mask at each source location, as in the definition of the template. It doesn't matter who instantiated the template, only who defined it. So if you have a template, in a header file, it doesn't matter what your local features are for the, for the user. It only matters what the conditions were when that template was defined. Uh, files don't inherit features. I've said this a couple times. This is like the real core novelty of this method. This is what makes it work. Uh, a feature mask has no effect on the files that it includes. So if you write feature mask in your CPP file, it doesn't matter what you include. Those things are unaffected. And similarly, uh, if you have library files and you're uh, authoring a library file and you subscribe to certain features, it doesn't affect the CPP files that include your library. So you can use advanced features to write your stuff and your users won't break because of it. It doesn't put uh, requirements on anyone using your code. Finally, don't use the pragmas even. I use the pragmas because I'm showing a lot of Compiler Explorer examples, which are single file, but it's better just to make a pragma.feature file, it just sits in a folder. And then every file, source file, in that folder gets initialized with the features listed in that file. So in your Pragma feature, make a, make a, make a file say, I want interface, I want choice, I want no narrowing integer conversions or whatever. And then every other file, every header file and CPP file automatically inherits those. And this creates a single point of definition for your features. It's easy to uh, use that Pragma feature file to deploy features into existing code. So there's some, a lot of safety and security related features like disabling error conversions, disabling the zero that can convert to a null pointer. So if you want to gradually um, modernize your code by making compatible with these newer features, create a Pragma feature file in that directory, add the feature to it, uh, do your build and test cycle until everything resolves. If something breaks, you know why it broke. It broke because of that one feature you put in. It, it'll be narrowing conversion related, it'll be related to ADL or forwarding or whatever. So fix that and then when all your tests build and, and uh, pass, you know you've just upgraded your, your project. So this gives you like a, a much easier way to migration than CPP2 or Carbon, which essentially require you to rewrite everything. The goal of this is to extend the productive lifetime of C++ by decades. 
Uh, Chandler was talking about C++ having decades of technical debt, but that's a victory that this language has been relevant for so long. And I think we can kind of manage that technical debt by versioning out of it so that it doesn't create a problem. It's only a problem for the compiler maintainers because if, if you turn those features you don't want off, you, you can go for another few decades. Um, we want to get rid of bad things. We want to add good things. And we don't want to break or change the meaning of this existing code. And finally, we can innovate without reaching consensus on any single issue. And I figure this will be the kind of controversial part. So let's take two of these uh, specifically to look. Uh, this is uh, showing integral promotion. So if I have a character x and I multiply it, the result is an integer, which is um, really surprising. Uh, it's just bad because it's surprising. So I can have a feature, no integral promotions, and now the decal type of the result is the decal type of the operands. So I just turn those off and it doesn't break anything. Uh, a new declaration syntax. So this is the most vexing parse. It looks like you're trying to initialize an object of type BT and provide it a value initialized argument of type AT. I mean, it looks like an object, but this is a function declaration because in C++, if a declaration parses like a function declaration, it is a fun function declaration. Uh, but we can turn that off. So I can use the new decal syntax, and now we have this Rust style, kind of more explicit, more verbose, but hopefully more legible way to declare things. So I'm declaring a function. I'm declaring a variable or a member. I'm declaring another function here. And here is my declaration that previously was a most vexing parse. Var object of type BT, and this is the initializer. This is explicitly a variable, not a function declaration. We've gotten through this, this, this horrific uh, most vexing parse. So this is, this is revisiting that slide from the Carbon Manifesto. Over time, the technical debt has um, uh, resulted in significant technical debt ranging from integer promotion rules to complex syntax with the most vexing parse. The two defects called out by name as motivating reasons to get the Carbon project have been fixed really trivially with these features. Um, I think it's important to group features into additions because it doesn't make sense to talk about dozens of these little changes. So I've got something called Edition 2023 and it combines all these different features. So some of them are about language richness, like choice and interface and the tuple, uh, first class tuple syntax, and some of them are about safety. And the safety ones are generally easier to put in, like no zero null pointer. If you have the zero literal, that's not a null pointer. You have to type out null pointer. Um, safer initializer list. You know the, the std vector initializer list. Sometimes it can accidentally choose the one to copy out some element n times, and there's ambiguity. Here it tries both paths, the initializer list path and the non-initializer list path. If they're both viable, the program is ill-formed. It tells you we've got two viable constructors, it's ill-formed, which one do you want to choose? And you have to go in there and make it explicit. So it bundles up all these little defect fixes and some major features and gives you an addition. And we can do the same thing. I can emulate the Carbon language, which is superficially different from C++ and also fundamentally different in that it fuses off a lot of the complex aspects of C++. There's no multiple inheritance, there's no user-defined constructors, there's no function overloading. You have to use interfaces for everything. So I can build on edition 2023, take all those features, and then add off things that the Google style guide people think is difficult to get people into C++. So we can have a version of C++ where you can call into functions that have been overloaded, but can't, you can't contribute your own overloads. Uh, and the the C++ community wit Victor has got a tweet, which is that I've implemented every programming language as a set of pragmas for circle. And like that would be fine for me. I think that's, that's pretty neat. Um, so thinking C++ is doomed is easy. Thinking C++ is ripe with potential, I think that takes independence of mind. So I, I think we're all with me here to have the independence of mind say, oh, at least for the remainder of the hour, let's assume we're not doomed as a language and that we have a lot of potential um, and that even though we're saddled with the decades of technical debt, like those defects, I think, are easily remedied. Um, and this presentation shows the work of just one guy over six months. And I think a lot of the, the reason for my productivity then is the way I can isolate individual changes and say, this is like just one change. I can work on it without worrying about how it affects the language as a whole, and I can do that in parallel. So whenever I am stopped on one issue, I can, I can uh, pivot to another issue. Um, there's like a real world of possibilities out there for making the language better. Uh, it's time to put creativity at the center of the C++ discourse. This is me, I am Titan Prometheus, <laughs> bringing to mortals the flame of creativity. 
Um, I've taken some giant swings with extensions, and I want other people to have the same license to take giant swings. I know that Bloomberg is trying to get the contracts extension out there, and I think, like, yeah, um, you shouldn't really allow other people to say you can't do that. Uh, if it's helpful for your business, you should have a path to see that happen. Um, people feel they can't innovate because of the prohibition on breaking or changing the meaning of existing code. That's only a problem in the mind. Um, sadly, this is also me. An eagle eating your liver is an ancient Greek metaphor for writing your own compiler. <laughs> um, okay, so there's a condition called isobrain where, um, you know, it's, it's when features I like you say are necessary and features other people like, you say the language is already too complex. Uh, do you notice the contradiction, right? Don't do this. Um, it, I'm gonna show you features that I don't care about. Uh, and if you don't care about, that's fine. Um, but you should just like do what I do, which is groan politely and roll your eyes. Don't jam up the process with like endless procedural badgering because that, that makes everything not work. So it's okay if, the, if you don't like all these features. Uh, these are all on my website. I'm not showing you all these today. Um, but they exist and they're not really hurting you by existing. Um, I have to remark that I have achieved a Zen state of non-attachment with respect to these features. So the list is much longer with ones I've like chucked out because they just weren't getting me anything. And some of these I might not like or I might want to add more, but I'm not really wed to any of them. What I am, what I find important is velocity, the ability to rapidly iterate on kind of the trunk of the compiler and say, ah, this is like getting us somewhere. This is really making programming easier and safer and more expressive. Um, starting with a working compiler builds confidence in your ideas. So this is the breakdown of the successor language landscape. Uh, C CPP, Front, Val, and Carbon were started from scratch, and nine of them have a compiler. And I don't think any of them will have a compiler, because trying to create a new language that interfaces seamlessly with C++ sort of implies that you're writing a C++ compiler. So I said, okay, I'm just going to absorb all that technical debt. I'm going to embrace the technical debt and work from an existing tool chain. Um, Everything I'm showing you here exists, and there's little Godbolt links. It makes the compilers real, it makes executables, it builds on top of standard C++. Um, if you start with the assumption that the language is unfixable, that's a faulty assumption that costs a lot of time and effort and doesn't get you very far, because you know Carbon is almost three years old, and there's no Hello World yet. There's no compiler. So it's, you want to hit the ground running. OK, let's look at some individual features. The first one is about implicit conversions, especially narrowing conversions, but also things like constructors called and user-defined conversion operators called from inside implicit conversion sequences. Uh, Jason Turner, the training guy, has all these videos, and he says implicit conversions are evil. Now, I wouldn't go that far necessarily, but you know, he's, he can have that opinion, and there's a lot of people who share that opinion, so I think we should give them the feature they want, which is to basically disable implicit conversions. So I've done that with these features, and the as feature brings in the as keyword, and that creates a Rust as expression, where I can now use expression as type ID as a more succinct static cast, but really expression as underscore that enables an implicit conversion that was banned by one of these features. All right, so if you, um, it follows the principle of least surprise. So it doesn't uh, change how operators overload or function resolution works, uh, uh, overload resolution works. The compiler still models the implicit conversion, but then if it gets to a point where it tries to generate the code for that and it violates one of these features, the, the program is ill-formed. And it'll tell you. It's very, very specific. Here's an example. Um, so I've turned on the as for the as keyword. No implicit integral narrowing and no implicit floating point narrowing. So if I can tell at compile time that something doesn't narrow, like it going from an int to a short, and I know what the value is, that's OK. I let that go by. Otherwise, I error. So here, I'm calling f short with x, and f short takes a short. So can I, this is an integer narrowing uh, uh, conversion, and it gives me an error. It says, no implicit integral narrowing, no implicit conversion from int to short. So it tells me the problem. And then I can go back and I can fix it. I can say, oh, x as short, that's okay, or x as underscore, and this now permits the conversion. So if you have your current existing code, you can put uh, these things in a pragma file, build it, and it will flag all of the potentially narrowing conversions in all the affected source files, prompts you, tells you what the types involved are, and then you can go through and resolve them with an explicit cast or just by allowing the implicit cast. Uh, ADL. Uh, there's a Sean Parent interview from a few years ago. What, would the feature, what feature would you remove from C++? 
And Sean Perrin says, it would probably be argument-dependent lookup. Like, OK, argument-dependent lookup is complicated because it's implicit. You don't know which namespaces you're looking at. Um, so let's make it opt-in, the same way we do with the implicit conversion. So uh, I have an ADL feature. ADL is now a keyword. If it shadows a variable you had called ADL, that's OK. You can backtick it um, and, still, and still access it. So now, this is OK, because I'm using a qualified name lookup. So this is not invoke ADL. That's OK. This is OK, because I'm using ADL get. And that's OK. Here I'm, I'm using get. And what happens, the compiler says, nope, because ADL candidate called, ADL candidate being get in the standard namespace, without an ADL token before unqualified name. So I can put this on my, uh, my Pragma feature file. I can run it through. And now it'll flag every use of an ADL candidate being called. And then I can go and say, oh, that's not really the one I had in mind. Um, so I can then uh, explicitly qualify it, or if it is the one you had in mind, you can explicitly qualify it or just escape it like that. Forward. Um, forward is like really badly implemented in my opinion. So I have a forward feature where forward is a keyword. Forward is a parameter directive, so you put it on a function parameter, and forward is also an expression. So if you want to forward something, you say forward and then the name of the parameter that you're forwarding. It can't be used incorrectly. The forward expression must name a forwarding parameter. And you can't inadvertently use std forward. Because now forward is a keyword, so to use it, you have to back tick it. And that looks like that really calls out attention to itself, right? Uh, here's, the, here's an example of why uh, forwarding, I think, is bad. Uh, I got this from Herb CPP2 CPP front implementation. This is his macro that he uses. And uh, you pass it x, and it takes the decal type, and then it calls it forward. And this is, I mean, the intent is good, but in practice, it's bad because decal type is very squirrely. <laughs> Uh, if you do things like this, if you try to, this is a forwarding parameter, right? If you try to forward a sub-object, that's not going to work because it always gives you back an R value reference right here. Like we passed an L value and we'd expect it to forward L value sub-objects, but it passed R value sub-objects. That's because decal type mixed with forward is very peculiar. It's very easy to misuse. Um, so with forwarding parameter, with the forwarding feature, we don't have that problem anymore. This is a, uh, a forwarding parameter pack. This is a forwarding parameter. And you say forward pair. If pair is not a forwarding parameter, the program is ill-formed. I can name sub-objects and it works as well, because this is the highest precedence. It actually binds tighter than any other prefix operator. So you write forward, and then the next thing is the parameter. That's good. So this is now an L value or an R value to match whatever the type of that is. And then you can say dot first, and all the sub-object access, everything works. Go ahead. Because I'm, uh, what do you mean, where? Here? Yeah, in your funk, you consume the same object twice, which. Yeah, that's, that's how it works. That's bad. Nope, that's, uh, I got that removed from the, uh, the C++ gui the design guidance, because everyone says that's bad, but that's how std apply works. That's how it has to work. You have to name the forwarding parameter n times if you want to access n sub-objects. Everyone says that's bad, but that's how it works. It can't work any other way. If you try to do it the, this way, right here, Right? This, is, this is gives you the wrong results. So you actually have to name the parameter, and then you have to access the sub-objects. So you end up naming the parameter n times. I've named this parameter n times. But you've named pair on the first line, and then on the second line, you're naming sub-objects of pair yeah. after having forwarded pair somewhere. Right here? Like, same line. It seems like the thing to do with, like, the second line on its own seems good. Well, th these are, I'm not saying do this. I'm saying, yeah, this is. Imagine these lines independently. This is number one, number two. I'm not saying this is a coherent program. Is that what the? Yes. yes. Oh. Like, I'm, I'm saying that if you're going to have a forward, forward as a language feature, it should also protect forwarding the same object. That's why we need relocation. Yeah. <laughs> because it doesn't. I mean, there's this, again, there's no, this is valid. There's nothing ill-formed about this. It's just unspecified. Re relocation would prevent that. And I agree. But this is just what the, this was what the mechanism does right now. And it's, it, is this better than the current state of the art, I think? Yes. OK, simpler precedents. But it could be even we will get, We'll get it. <laughs> um, there's too many levels of operator precedents. I've had to probably search for this chart like 100 times since I started programming. I'm sure everyone has to use this because it's really squirrely right here. Like, why, are, why this order? I don't know. Um, the bitwise operations, again, are way too low precedents. Like, that's crazy that they're lower precedents than the comparisons. So Google, ha the Carbon project has this control flow graph. Um, I think it's the most attractive language simplification. So you follow the, the chart from bottom to top, 
and you can only mix operators in one of these silos. And if you want to mix operators from multiple ones, you have to use parentheses to make your precedence explicit. Uh, so here's what happens if you, we have a simpler uh, precedence and you write a normal C++ expression, that's an error because simpler precedence features is you cannot follow the operator logical or with the operator logic land because I know what the precedence is here, but not everybody does. So it makes sense to make that ill-formed unless you go in and explicitly indicate the precedence you want. Another thing, you can just enable this in your code. You could probably find some bugs even if you go and manually resolve all the, all the issues as they come up. Choice types, okay, this is the first of the really big uh, features. This is the type safe discriminated union. Um, it's just like Ruff's and Swift's enum. It's better than std variant because std variant has an values by exception state. Um, so it's got this kind of like ghost state and you always have to check for that if you have um, types that can potentially, potentially throw in their copy constructors. So I got rid of that uh, and I've added things like convenient dotted initializers and it compiles quickly and it's just easier to use. And there's of course a pattern match which is really similar to the pattern matching found in C sharp. So I, this is the third time I've implemented pattern matching. And um, this is probably the simplest one so far. And C sharp, like, I think got it right, and they got it late. But it's like, it looks nice. So I kind of just adhered to some of their conventions. Um, and this is, this is Herb Sutter's talk from CppCon 2021. Um, he goes for an hour 37 talking about pattern matching. I'm gonna do it for like one minute and 37 seconds because I have a lot of stuff and I don't wanna convince you about my pattern matching design. It's not that important to me. The point is that if you don't like mine, you can make your own pattern matcher. Like the language is elastic like that. So this is the pattern matching. Um, here's a choice type. And I um, am indicating the payload is a tuple because this is the new tuple syntax. And I have an alternative called my array, which has an array type, and an alternative called my scalar, which is a short. I pass it to this uh, new decal syntax function, and then here's the match. And dot my tuple, dot my array, et cetera, these are the alternative names that are, got, that are gotten, inferred through the type of the, the argument here. Uh, I can match, uh, I can do a test, so I can destructure the payload. In this case, the payload's an integer and a string. So if the integer is one, that matches, and then I can bind a variable b to, to that, and then I can output it or do additional tests. There's if guards, all that stuff. This is, more, this is kind of documented on my, on my web page. Um, but it's, it's really similar to what C-sharp does. Um, this is another example. I have ranges, so you can test, is this argument between 10 and 20? Is it even? So even is a function, uh, is an overload set. So it'll call uh, the overload set, and you wanna have a uh, constraint so that you don't get an ill-formed thing. If you pass, say, like a, a float, and it won't be able to do module on the float, you'll get ill-formed program, so you wanna make sure you constrain your your tests, but this is stuff that Herb talked about in his talk. I've kind of made it a little simpler and safer as, as respect to like not quite trying so hard to do conversions. Um, let's get to the real, the real meaty feature, which is interfaces. Uh, this is like a Rust trait or a Swift protocol. It's a third way of organizing functions by receiver type. I have um, interfaces, I have interface templates. I have impulse, which is how you explicitly indicate that some type satisfies the requirements of the interface. I have the dyne keyword. Uh, this is a first class dynamic type erasure. This is exactly like Rust dyne. And I have make dyne, which is how you turn a pointer to a complete object into a dyne pointer. The dyne pointer is a 16 byte fat pointer. It has a pointer to data and has a pointer to a dyne table. A dyne table is like a V table, but the pointer to it is not internal to the object, it's external. It's just like Rust design. Um, Okay, three ways to organize functions. C++ has two of those. Uh, Rust has the third one, and Carbon wants to do the third one. First of all, we have object-oriented, where methods are bound with data. So we have uh, member functions, so you can say like, you know, a1.print, and a1, or the left-hand side of that, is the receiver type. Then we have overloading, where you can pass uh, a parameter, and let's just say the first parameter is our receiver type. So we're gonna be overloading based on the parameter type here. So if you call print and you pass it an A, an A2 type, it'll call this one. If you pass it a B2 one type, it'll call that one. And finally, interfaces, where the receiver type is implicit. Um, I have an interface. Interface defines its requirements. You have some um, classes or types that are defined 
independently of the interface, and then you have to go and explicitly implement the interface for each type. And now I can call uh, the interface methods as if they were member functions, but it's all external, right? The, the, the advocates for, say, for this say it's the best way because uh, there is external declarations, so you don't have to mess up your original data, data type, and also there's no overloading, so there's no like overload resolution. I still permit function overloading. You can, you can have like overloaded versions of prints here. I'm not taking that away, but there's a feature to take that away. But, but the, the chief way to differentiate between receiver types is through who implements this interface. Um, so this is like a, a pretty ex basic example. I'm defining an interface called iPrint. There's an auto keyword at the end which says, if a type just already implements uh, all of its member functions, or uh, all of its methods, then implicitly allow an impl. And this is part of like the old C++ OX Doug Greger concepts proposal. I, I did roll that part forward. And then I have to bring these impls into scope. Rust has um, some specific rules having to do with crates, but for now I just think, just like bring the outer product of these interfaces and types into scope, and then I can call them without qualification. So I have int x equal 100 and <laughs> double y equal 1.618, and I'm calling x.print x dot, or y dot print, I'm calling what looks like member functions on built-in types. That's, that's, I'm externally extending the interface for built-in types. All right. Uh, type parameters are also, are, uh, interfaces are also constraints. So let's consider a, a function template that takes a type T. I can constrain it to one or more interfaces. So I say colon, an interface name, and I can have uh, ampersands to, I can say I print and I copy and I clone or whatever, string them up. And now this is both a constraint and it also injects the, these interfaces into scope. So you pass it 101 or 1.618. These are just normal built-ins. And because both of these types implement the, um, the print method through the default implementation here, they pass this check. So int passes the check, it implements iPrint and double implements iPrint. And now I can say object.print. And I can be calling print methods on um, on built-ins, and like Rust people get very excited about that. Uh, yeah, you can just you can you can declare things. Uh, you can have Im impulses that are done implicitly, or you can explicitly define them. Here, I'm defining I print for a double impul double. It looks like inheritance. I wanted to make this copy our uh, C++ practice of using inheritance. So you normally inheritance a inherit a base class, and the derived class implements it here the impl looks like it inherits an interface. I think that's just like a, an easier way to teach it. So I've got a, uh, an impl for double and I have an impl for all other arithmetic types as a template. So you can have an impl template and then uh, the, the int is satisfied through this impl template. And I can use some reflection to get the, the kind of type and I can print it out. So the program says I'm unsigned as 100 and double is 1.618. So this is the third kind of way to organize functions. Type erasure. There have been like millions of type erasure uh, conference talks, um, like no papers, but a lot of conference talks. Here's four of them uh, over the years. A uh, really good one is this Klaus Ugelberger one from two years ago. He's like, gives you a very like sober um, breakdown of what it takes to do type erasure, dynamic type erasure. Dynamic type erasure is external polymorphism. So um, I don't want to just extend the interface to some type. I want to extend the interface to some type and then erase the type. I want to access this new functionality through a base pointer. But I don't have inheritance, right? Because uh, exploiting inheritance gives you virtual tables, which is nice and convenient, but it requires you to put the methods inside the class definition. I'm going to do this externally. So uh, I'm going to create a type called Dyne. And Dyne is templated, and it's templated over an interface. And so Dyne of iFace is a type that has all the member functions, or all the methods of iFace. And a pointer to it is 16 bytes. So now I can call through this pointer, right? Eight bytes for the data and eight bytes for the virtual table, the, the Dyn table. Uh, Eric Niebler says if you go back in time and change C++, he would add language support for type erasure. Um, yeah, okay, well, let's do it. So this stuff I've already showed you in previous slides, only stuff from line 25 is new. So let's create an integer and a string. Now we're going to type erase the object. So I'm saying make dyne of iFace. This requires that this object implements iFace, which it does explicitly. And it returns to me a pointer that doesn't have anything to do with int or anything to do with the string. 
These are type arrays. These are abstract base class pointers, but without the base class. And I can, I can invoke them. That's like, uh, that's pretty different. Um, I've got nine kinds of template parameters. Now, you can pass interfaces as template parameters. You can pass interface templates as template parameters. And you think, well, uh, you can pass namespaces as template parameters and universal template parameters. You can get, like, pass out of the concepts. Uh, nine kinds is actually really useful to model any kind of language entity as a template parameter. It gives us the flexibility to, in library, create uh, mechanisms that in other languages are, have to be first class language entities. And the one I have in mind here is the clone functionality. So in Rust, there's uh, like a clone interface or clone trait to allow you to have value semantics with these type race things. And value semantics, I basically just mean I have some object on the right hand side. I don't know what its type is, but I know that it implements some interfaces, some traits. But I want to be able to copy construct from it. But how do I copy construct fr from it if I don't know what it is? Well, it needs to implement clone. But I don't want to go in there and make you, the user, like define a clone function for everything. So I'm going to create an interface called iClone that's marked auto, meaning if the type implements all of its or satisfies its requirements, the input will be generated automatically. And I want to have it inherit the interface that I parameterize over. This is an interface template. And I'm, I'm specializing over another interface. This is the interface you want. And this is the clone that will derive it. So this, this, this interface clone derives iFace. And it returns a std unique pointer, normal std unique pointer, specialized on Dyn. Oh, I should explain. These bangs right here, this is the, um, the new uh, template brackets where the, you know, the left, less than greater template brackets are like super ambiguous. You have to disambiguate all the time. So I took something from uh, dlang, which is a, a, an exclamation mark with the brackets, or just the exclamation mark, and then the next identifier or next uh, token is the argument. So this is a single argument, and since most templates are specialized over a single argument, you can just chain them up. So the std unique pointer over dyn, over iClone, this is the type, that gets returned from clone, and then this is automatically generated. The default implementation applies to any type that is copy constructible. So if the, if the receiver type self is copy constructible, this clone function gets generated. If your type is not copy constructible, but you still want to implement clone, fine, implement clone explicitly. Otherwise, hands off, we'll just call, um, we'll just let out, use this auto-generated clone, which then calls make unique dyn right here. All these types is manged together. This is library code, right? Um, it will copy construct from the type, which is known, you, given the arguments that you have, which are itself, self, and it returns a copy. So we can basically achieve value semantics with these templated interfaces by passing interfaces around as template parameters. And you think, well, that's like maybe over engineering, like, you know, why, why did it do this? It's over engineering, but it allows in just like a few lines to this really super fundamental functionality. Um, incentivizing investment in language technology. So a lot of organizations have like principal scientists, architects, staff researchers, and these are professional language opiners. Like John, John is, and Josh is a, a professional language opiners. Right? They like, they, they, they find everyone like grab by the lapel and they tell them their language ideas, right? Um, so I'm gonna pick on, I'll pick on Josh because he was, he was bothering me earlier with some ideas. So I, I'm gonna get you, right? Okay, so Josh is in the cave or wherever you work and you have an idea, a flash of inspiration that if we use Pig Latin to name variables, they're immutable. And you did a study. We don't want const keyword, we don't want const expert, we just want Pig Latin names. And there's a dictionary you have to build in the compiler so it can check. Uh, Pig Latin name will save the company 10 million over 10, 100 million over 10 years, right? Now, you're gonna take action. You're gonna, you're gonna go to six conferences a year, you're gonna submit proposals, you're gonna do the study groups, and you repeat this for five years. And everyone in your organization is convinced, right? Uh, but what happens? You spend a lot of time and money advocating for this thing, and there's no feature at the end because you were unable to reach consensus. So, in essence, it's important for your organization, but, but we're leaving money on the table, right? Personally, I think that idea is really dumb. But professionally, what business is it of mine what he does with his organization, right? I think that can go for anyone. What business is it for someone on the working group? What, other, what, what features are important to other people? It's not their business. Um, yeah, what business is it of mine what you do with your organization? This is my no busybody principle. I want to give you a path to at least try the Pig Latin feature. Conceptualize it. You can build it in a compiler, you can test it on the code you have, and you can distribute it internally. 
And if it works out, upstream it with the vendor, and then let the vendors worry about making sure the other vendors in the space are also providing the same feature. And they can work, they can work on the wording, but I, I at least want to allow you some cycle to put this thing in. And you don't have to worry about it breaking compatibility because, again, it would be constrained to whatever files subs uh, subscribe to it. Um, everything in this talk is built by me over six months. The feature system encourages rapid creation. And I guess the question is, like, how does this change the value proposition of, of really supporting language development? If you want to get contracts, language level allocators, whatever else, into, into your business, you need a path to do that. Um, you need a path to get the changes into a compiler. And a lot of companies have, with, that have been around for decades have tons of institutional knowledge. How do you turn institutional knowledge into technology? How do you turn it into value? And I don't think the consensus model for ISO standardization is the way to do it. Um, this is Vittorio's uh, Epic's paper. It should have gotten more traction. Um, his kind of paper diverges from mine and my feature system in two ways. The first is that he pegs everything to modules. And I think files are simpler. Everyone knows what a file is, except for, I guess, the ISO standard itself, which claims not to know. But modules are like a lot harder to, to deal with. Um, but, but really, the, the, the core difference is that Vittorio says that he wants um, not to provide small tunable knobs, instead a single linearly, linear monotonically increasing sequence of language flavors. So he's, he's kind of cool with C++ 20, 23, 26, 29, maybe finer grain, but still linear and monotonically increasing. Um, that design is great if you're the designer. If these are all your changes, do the single monotonically increasing set of versions. But like, it still requires consensus. It hasn't resolved the core issue of people having disagreements. And I think the, you resolve the, um, the issue of people having disagreements with standard like John Locke liberalism, which is that let everyone kind of do what they want. Uh, OK, these are features I'm working on now um, that I want to get in the compiler soon. People have Rust Envy, bad cases of Rust Envy. Don't eat your heart out. Identify the things you like in Rust and then implement them in C++. And this way, C++ keeps up support, it keeps getting funded, it keeps getting innovation, people keep learning it, and we keep our, you know, we, we continue to build money-making projects. It doesn't require a, a fresh restart, but rewrite it in Rust Crowd is neglecting the reality that a lot of projects actually generate revenue, and that's important to keep people employed. Um, so, from this list of Rust features, I've implemented interfaces, I've implemented choice types, I have new declaration syntax, none of these are complete, but they're all like, you know, pretty compelling samples. Oh, the as expression for implicit conversions. But relocation, that's in development. Rust relocates. It has uh, ownership semantics, it has destructive move. And it's got borrow checking. It has ref and ref mute types and expressions. And there's a static, ana uh, static analysis that runs to make sure you're not violating the conditions of those uh, borrow types. So uh, relocation, I've been working with Josh. Uh, we've been sending ideas back and forth on how to go forward. He says he has a, a rival plan to my plan. And I may implement both if I, if I like it. Because why not? We can have relocate and relocate Josh's plan or whatever. Uh, here, we're going to add a new special member function called the relocate constructor. And uh, this is a constructor, even though it uses the relocate keyword. And it's only called from a relocate expression, line 24. So you create an object here. And I would say, oh, I'm going to relocate this. And now I can call it from P2, but if I call it from P1, P1's dead, right? And st static analysis was tell us, oh, P1 has been relocated, right? Um, I, I think this is important first step towards borrow checking. Uh, I don't know if borrow checking is good or not, but a lot of people say it's critical. And I think it depends on what industry you're working in. Finance has like a higher bar for getting things right than video games. Um, and you play Dark Souls game and all the bugs are like part of the charm, but that's not the case when you probably roll out terminal, right? So um, yeah, I think we, I want to introduce ref and ref mute types as first class types, ref and ref mute as expressions, and it's the same constraints or same requirements that Rust gives you. There's multiple uh, immutable references to an object and there's one mutable reference. And you have to lower to a mid-level IR and that will do lifetime analysis of the borrows. So now we have relocation to change ownership, and then we have the borrows that are constrained by ownership. So a borrow can't outlive the object. And this does cut down on a lot of memory safety issues. Uh, but what's important here is to develop borrow checking independently of unrelated features. So the Val, Dave Abrams' Val project, um, he had this alter, alternate to borrow checking called mutable value semantics. 
He's like, okay, hey, let's, let's write a, a research language to do that. But there's no compiler still. And it's because it's hard writing a compiler. It's hard lowering code to LLVM and like getting all the systems calls. So I think it's great to just drop this into C++ because it's not that hard. People say C++ is like intrinsically unsafe and that's like not the case. It just hasn't been safe so far because there haven't been safety features in it. But we add borrow checking, then if you write stuff using the ref and ref mute types and expressions, it will be checked by the borrow checker. Finally, this is the kind of long-term goal for me, argument directives. I think this would be a, a lovely future for, type, or for a memory safe C++, where uh, I can pass things by value on line one, I can pass things by ref on line two, and I can pass them by ref mute on line three. Rust has like a slightly different syntax. We could move to that syntax, whatever. But we have to be explicit about what we're doing to an object. We can copy an object. So copy is a keyword. And this does not pass an L value. This actually passes a new value. And it, this does the copy here and passes that. It does the move. It steals the resource. It doesn't pass an R value reference. It doesn't pass an X value expression. It steals the resource. The object still lives, but the resource has been taken. Now what happens is you can grep through the code. You can just look at the code. You know where the copies are. You know where the moves are. You know, oh, this has been done for performance reasons. But if I have a, a bug where, oh, I thought, I thought there was some resource here, but the vector's already been cleared out. Well, it's much more obvious to know where that happened when you have an explicit move. And then implicitly, you will relocate objects. So if I call func and I pass it the object, it's going to call number one, which is the relocation. It'll call the relocate constructor. And then later on, you can't use that object again. Uh, finally, borrow checking. Ref will produce a non-immutable uh, reference to number two, which is borrow checked. And this ref mute will pass a mutable reference, which would be borrow checked as well. And then you get the lifetime um, uh, requirements in here. So I think this is like a, not long term, but like within the next year for sure, uh, would be possible to get out to have all this. Does this mean that all our C++ code is automatically memory safe or borrow checked? No, like code that's already written is written, right? And we're not gonna make that memory safe. We're not gonna make that borrow check. The borrow checker, is about you, the programmer, writing a proof, proving to the compiler that you're not doing something bad. And if you violate, if you don't provide a sufficient proof or one that the compiler can understand, it will tell you. But there's no magic bullet here. Hopefully, the code that you have deployed is basically low on bugs, and we already know how to get more bugs out of it. But this gives you an ability for new code or code that you want to rewrite to work with your current assets, not modify those in any way, but they'll just have a clean start and do borrow checking for, for new stuff. Uh, I think I'm just discovering the potential that's in C++. Uh, there's really no knowing where this development will take us. We have to create to learn. Uh, to the last bit, I, I'm like a huge novel reader. I read like 30 novels a year. It's like important for my creativity. So I decided to do like a book review. Now at the end of every talk, and I, I, I was wearing a, this jacket because of the mics, but I got like a Grendel shirt here, which is the book I'm going to be promoting here. So I, I you know, have a minute. I'll, I'll use it on promote some uh, Beowulf fan fiction. So Beowulf is like the, uh, original, mo the original significant old English epic. It was written more than a thousand years ago. You don't know by who. Uh, it's, about this, uh, it's about this guy with the strength of 30 thanes Beowulf who sails from Sweden to Denmark to tussle with Grendel as a monster. And he, he pretends to be asleep and then the monster grabs him and he pulls his arm off. It's, like, there's, it's not super complicated. It's not that good of a book because the Vikings weren't bookish people. Um, they, it's not like the Iliad, which is some incredible masterpiece, but it's important to thinkers who look to the North rather than to Greece. So like Tolkien and Richard Wagner, et cetera, they really like Norse sagas, and um, Tolkien translated this into modern English. Um, but it's, it's not that good of a book, but people have been thinking about it since it was discovered like 400 years ago. And so in 1971, this New Yorker, John Gardner, uh, rewrote the story, but from Grendel's perspective, and there's a dragon at the end where uh, Beowulf fights a dragon. But here, Grendel talks to the dragon, and the dragon knows everything. He sees time and space, and he, he, he understands like dialectical materialism, and he understands existentialism. So he, he tells Grendel that your role is a historical antagonist, and you're going to be a jerk to people. You're going to go and like murder people and like kill all the livestock and all that, but you're doing it for a good reason, which is to challenge men, to force them to form a common defense, societies, and government. This is like a, an antagonist to, prevent, to, to force them to kind of evolve society. Um, and so Grendel has many monologues about this responsibility, and it's, it's a really good French existential novel like you'd see in the 1940s or 50s, but it's told by an actual uh, 
child of Cain, this, this, ter this horrible monster who has really no redeeming qualities, but he's like very self-aware. So it's a good book, and um, I think it's important to, to read a lot of novels so you don't become dogmatic, that's all. Uh, no questions, go make language evolution. Thank you. All right. <laughs>